Hi, I'm Dr. Dominic King, sports medicine physician at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'll be speaking about tendinosis and the role of minimally invasive tenotomy for treatment of tendinosis. First, I'd like to bring up talking about how we look at tendinopathy, and musculoskeletal ultrasound has been a tool that has really changed the game for us in being able to identify different features of tendinopathy under ultrasound, of which we used to assume was only inflammatory. Um, we knew there must have been some degenerative changes and some potential of tearing, but we didn't really have a principled way to take a look at that under ultrasound and translate that into care. So for any of you who are familiar with using musculoskeletal ultrasound, this is a common extensor tendon with lateral epicondyle and a radial head. The radial capitellar joint is here, and the arrows delineate the top of that common extensor tendon. Under ultrasound, under power Doppler, we're able to see neovascularization, new blood flow through the tendons, uh, which indicates a uh, chronic expression of inflammatory uh, signals. Uh, this comes in as being more of an inflamed type of tendon, uh, even though it probably takes time for these blood vessels to grow, and this is a tendon that's been under stress for a while, this definitely feels to patients more inflammatory. When you see this in the office, it's a, uh, a hot red type of tender swollen area, opposed to the degenerative tendinosis uh, that we've become more familiar with. As those sound waves propagate through the tendon, the type three softer, more mucinous type of tendon tissue that's there, uh, allow the sound waves to propagate through so it looks like that darker hypoechoic area. Uh, and then because we can see both of those, uh, we know that there's uh, some patients who present with a mix uh, and that tends to anecdotally fit with their symptoms as well, where the hyperemia ends up being a more painful acute type of pain, uh, even though again, the condition probably has been around for a while and the tendinosis being the stiff, achy type of pain that patients get uh, when they're in one position for a while and then go to move and they uh, have tightness in, in elbow range of motion. Same for other uh, joints in the body. One of the questions we asked was whether or not we can re reliably identify these findings. Most uh, practitioners uh, and providers who use ultrasound know that we can see these, uh, but how reliably can we do that? So. Uh, Last year, uh, 2021, uh, we published a study looking at inter and intraorator agreement on uh, several different findings. Uh, we used uh, 50 different full cine loop evaluations uh, that were not marked up by musculoskeletal radiologists, um, and each of us looked at it, two different evaluations uh, on two different sitting days. There were two musculoskeletal radiologists, two fellowship trained primary care sports medicine uh, physicians who were myself and uh, my colleague, Dr. Jason Jenin, uh, and two novice uh, sports medicine fellows who, were, who uh, were just new and did a uh, workshop on identifying ultrasound uh, findings. So with that, we were able to show that there was uh, highly reliable consistency, inter and intraorator reliability of identifying hyperemia uh, and that hypoecogenicity or the tendinosis. Um, there was some good uh, reliability of uh, several other uh, findings, but really it was those two that were most qualitative uh, and had the highest reliability, and that was consistent across all the readers. So with that, uh, we developed what we call our intertendinous content model. And this is a way to describe to patients and to colleagues uh, how we're uh, theorizing that uh, tendons become uh, painful uh, and uh, pathologic. So on the left is uh, what would be a normal tendon. So all of these white uh, circles identified as a cross-sectional area of type one collagen. So healthy, normal, dense, regular connective tissue. Um, and this isn't meant to be in sequence, but these are the different types that we see. We don't really know that hyperemia shows up before degenerative tendinosis, uh, but we definitely can see it in absence of uh, one another. So any of the red circles identified as neovascularization, these tenuous blood vessels that have grown into the tendon because of that chronic either expression of vascular endothelial growth factor or some signal that there is damage in the tendon uh, and the body needs to neovascularize that area in an attempt to heal or address uh, the issue. The darker circles being that type three, type four, the basement membrane, elastic type of collagen uh, that doesn't have that same dense regular uh, collagen uh, feel and look uh, in uh, actual physical uh, presence as type one collagen, and then the mix between them. And, and what this shows is 
as each of these end up growing into the tendon and are present, the tendon itself gets bigger, it gets thicker. Uh, common extensor tendons really can't tell as much. Achilles tendons, certainly mid-substance Achilles tendons, this is what you see. Uh, right before an Achilles tendon ruptures, uh, we know from an evidence-based standpoint, uh, this is what a tendon looks like over on, on, on the end here. It's thickened, you can see that thickening, that big fusiform uh, swelling inside the Achilles tendon, and it's filled uh, with areas of hyperemia and tendinosis. So with that, uh, we developed a very simple qualitative classification combining what we've seen before in that study that uh, showed the reliability of hyperemia and tendinosis. So when we speak, just to get some semblance around how we're classifying tendons, a type one tendon would essentially be a normal tendon, meaning there was no hyperemia and no tendinosis. Type two, uh, what we call inflammatory, um, not necessarily meaning that it, it is just acute inflammation, but there is this chronic neovascularization that's in that tendon, and it feels like an acute flare-up of the, the tendon. That's positive hyperemia with the absence of tendinosis. Just the opposite of that being a primarily degenerative tendon, having the presence of tendinosis without any overwhelming hyperemia or neovascularization. And then a type four being a combined uh, tendon uh, issue of chronic degenerative tendinosis with overlying hyperemia. So type one, type two, type three, type four. This allows us to start identifying separate discrete patient populations that may or may not benefit from certain treatments. One treatment that we feel is beneficial for the uh, findings of type three and type four where tendinosis is predominant uh, is minimally invasive tenotomy. And the role of that is using the uh, Tenjet device to debride, resect and remove this degenerative tendon tissue to reduce pain and then enhance the tendon function. So with the schematic at the top, if you remove this degenerative tendon tissue um, and that now has a tendon that can be reloaded, the hope is, and what we've been able to see under ultrasound and what's uh, been shown through thousands of uh, cases now, um, reapproximation of these type 1 fibers uh, into a more functional tendon. Uh, and we believe uh, from, from a, a theory standpoint that this is the reason why patients' pain uh, is, and function uh, is changed after minimally invasive tendonomy because of that direct resection and removal of the tendinosis, allowing and returning that normal function. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully this gives you an understanding of how we're starting to approach tendons differently and opens up a conversation that you can have with patients, uh, not only about their condition and their pathology, but the role of a minimally invasive treatment to directly address that. Thank you.